Today on Locked On Canadians, are the players we've written off becoming the biggest trade chips for the Habs? Plus a win against Chicago, and we have to talk, unfortunately, about Arbor Jack Eye's injury. All that's coming up on Locked On Canadians. Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to episode 785. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more, and you can get started by visiting fanduel.com slash locked on. My name is Laura Saba, also known as the Active Stick, and I'm joined, as always, by the wonderful Scott Matla, and we have lots to talk about, but first, but first we must thank you so much for subscribing on YouTube, sus- subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. We are free and available everywhere. Thank you so much for making us your first listen of the day. Scott, let's talk about that game. I think we should break down this episode. First, we're, we should talk about that win against the Blackhawks, and then we should talk about who the Montreal Canadiens' biggest trade chips are becoming. And then finally, we should talk about Arbor Jack Eye's injury and what that means for the Canadians for the remainder of this season. Let's talk about that game first. I, uh, but neither of these teams are very good. I mean, <laughs> I say that in a positive manner for the Canadians and a completely disrespectful one for the Chicago Blackhawks. And even with these teams both being bad, they're both lottery teams. The Canadians were so much better than the Blackhawks. It's honestly a little bit embarrassing. I know Patrick Kane is a subject of trade rumors and this and that. I've never seen someone look so disinterested outside of Pierre-Luc Dubois in Columbus. Just non-factor the entire game. And this is a game where Chicago had their opportunities. Their power play had chances. They had a five-on-three for nearly two full minutes and did nothing with it. This was a the one, the first shutout for the Canadians this season. Any goaltender, 4 nothing, Really good. Great for Jake Allen. And I don't say that like in a, in a oh, but the tank. Jake Allen deserved this. They're on a three-game winning streak. And you know what? This game was just, it was, it was beating the Blackhawks over the head. And it wasn't. Nick Suzuki. It wasn't Kirby Doc. It wasn't even superstar Raphael Harvey Pinard. It was, again, Yol Armia, Christian Dvorak, Justin Barron, David Savard. Like the names that stood out in this game were not the top lines. It was the bottom six and some unexpected defensemen. And if you're Martin St. Louis and you're the Canadians, you're looking at that and go, okay. We didn't need to have Nick Suzuki or Kirby Doc go off to beat Chicago. The bottom six and like the trade chips, so to speak, got it done pretty easily, in fact. It is true. And and this is the thing is that we are going to get into the trade chip aspect of it later. But every time somebody scored, like I would be like, are are we sure? Are we are we sure was that guy? Are we, you know, two goals in a row, two games in a row with a goal? Like, really? <laughs> um so there were a lot of those moments. And obviously you're happy for those guys. Uh, something that I did want to mention about Patrick Kane, which I, I don't know if it's concerning or not. Um, obviously, I'm not a big fan of his. He's just, he's, eh, you know. Um, obviously he had talent. He's on the downside of his career. He's overpaid. He's sitting around waiting for a trade to a contender. But he said something interesting about Kirby Doc. And it like people kind of um, hung up on the, coaching aspect of it where it was like talking about like of course like Kirby Doc is having a better season like he was just never put in a position to succeed before so I mean that was clearly very pointed discussion and apparently he's been honest about this kind of stuff in the past but what the one thing that he that he hit on that kind of has me a little bit concerned is he was talking about how he was constantly being played not enough minutes and on the fourth line now if you turn to Montreal and then who before his injury was playing not a lot of minutes and also a lot on the fourth line. So I don't know if I should be concerned or not, because like, this is just a soundbite from Patrick Kane. 
All right. Sorry. Okay. Go on. Go on. <laughs> so here's my thought with that. When Kirby Doc was in Chicago, they thought they still had a contending window. Okay. At that time, they were not in this tear it down mode yet. And as someone pointed out, their head coach was an idiot. Uh, Jeremy Colleton was, <laughs> as some people said, it's might be one thing. of the might be one of the worst coaches in NHL history. They thought they had a window to still contend while Kane and Taze were still here. That's why they traded for Seth Jones. And that was just not true. They didn't guess their cur- aging curve well at all here. And Kirby Doc kind of ended up being punished for that. And that's not really his fault. In Montreal, we knew the team was rebuilding. And they don't want to just, you know, send Uri Slavkovsky out there to just get beat over the head against top lines over and over again. Because it's hard to develop what you need when you're just when you don't have a chance to you know develop in that there is some truth in it in that maybe he should have been with the rocket we're obviously past that point in time right now because he's injured he will probably join the rocket if he is coming back this year but i'm not going to fuss over it too much because i think the canadians know what they're doing the process seems complicated because it's not something we're used to seeing right now but in chicago like they thought they were still going to be good. And Kirby doc just got kind of tossed by the wayside. And we've seen this with other pieces. And I, I almost can't help but think this is what Edmonton's going to do with the SC RB too, whether it's the Habs or someone else. Development is important, but if you don't put them in a situation to succeed, you're not going to get development out of it. And Patrick Kane is right. Is that, you know, through gritted teeth and tears and coping and seething and whatever you want to call it, he is right in that they didn't really give Kirby doc the opportunity to succeed. And now he gets to Montreal and they go, you're a top six forward. And he goes, okay. And he seems to be thriving in that role. He it's uh, it is an interesting wrinkle that I had completely forgotten about uh, with everything that happened in this game. Yeah. I think that's a big one. Uh, I do feel kind of, I feel, I feel a lot uh, better now. Uh, Another thing that I kind of wanted to bring up, just before we go into our next segment i was like watching the clock as i was about to bring this up all right scott real quick what surprises are there in the underlying numbers with the montreal canadians beating the chicago blackhawks uh at the bottom of the possession numbers kirby doc uh he was 37 percent in expected goals for five on five quite incredible At, at the other end at the top jonathan drewan 94.25% 94.25% expected goals for five on five. He and Yol Armia had a hunt. And uh, also I believe that is Christian Dvorak had a hundred percent scoring chance for at five on five. All these are coming from our friends at natural stat trick, which you can find at naturalstattrick.com. Super easy. Canadians dominated this game. Even if some of the lower line or top lines didn't have the gaudy numbers guys, you want to see playing well going into the trade deadline playing this well perfect exactly what you want to see in a game like this it wasn't pretty mind you the through a period and a half this might be one of the most boring games i've ever seen but you know what they got the job done also josh anderson beat a dude up so there's also that we are gonna get to that actually let's move that to the third segment in which we are going to talk about arbor jack Eye because you were just talking about Jonathan Duran's possession numbers and i think it is time to discuss whether these players that we'd written off are actually going to become the trade chips we want them to be. And that's coming up in just one moment. But first, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because new customers get a no-sweat First bet up to $1,000. This is really the time for you to do this. That is bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drained. And honestly, like I started getting into basketball very, very recently, and there's all kinds of really interesting things that happen in the game that you can bet on. Plus, FanDuel is even going to let you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet of up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. 
Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA and us. Us too. Um, all right. So one of the things that I think we have kind of not necessarily lamented, but there were some players that we knew at the beginning of the season that were going to be on the trading block and were potentially going to be gone before the trade deadline or at the trade deadline. And over the course of the season, they haven't necessarily proved to be attractive trade chips thus far, whether it's because of injury, lack of effort, bad luck. I mean, Mike Hoffman tried his best, right? There were some players that we weren't super... Um, enthusiastic about. But in the last couple of games, I got to say, Christian Dvorak has stepped it up. Um, Yoel Armia has stepped it up. And Jonathan Druin has stepped it up. So let's talk about these guys. Let's talk about how, you know, even a week ago, well, a week ago was the, you know, All-Star game. Um, let's talk about how 10 days ago, <laughs> um, we would not have been talking about these players in this way. Yeah, so... What's funny is uh, Jonathan Drouin still has no goals on the season, not for a lack of trying, but has 12 assists in his last 12 games played. And they found a line where he just seems to work with Armia and Dvorak. Dvorak's been playing better. The Canadians are not a high scoring team here. Cole Caulfield is still second on the team in scoring. And he hasn't played in a, almost what three, four weeks, a month, whatever. Kirby doc is one point before him. Nick Suzuki's in first place. Josh Anderson is their third leading goal scorer with 15 goals, playing better hockey. Christian Dvorak playing better hockey. Mike Hoffman playing better. They're just playing better in general, and they're peaking at the right time. And I don't think David Savard's going anywhere this season, obviously, but I do think, and these numbers might be slightly off it. ESPN hasn't updated them yet, but like, all these guys are generating points at a time when you want them to. Like Drew Ann is on an expiring deal, and we're going from we might get a fifth round pick for Drew Ann too. Some teams are going to see this power play production as a playmaker and some five on five production as a playmaker, and they're going to go, We want to add that to our team. He doesn't have to be a main tool like he does with the Canadians sometimes. He can be that um, auxiliary piece. And I think someone like him is going to draw attention. Evgeny Dodonov is playing better. He's not having a great year by his standards. But this season started so rottenly for everyone not named Nick Suzuki and Cole Caulfield that, of course, all their numbers are playing catch up now. And the team still isn't great. But, but it's the, a good time for the for the numbers to restabilize, right? Exactly. They're starting to bounce back in a way that you want them to. And they're not setting the world on fire. They're not. And Duran had three assists tonight. Hoffman had three assists last week. Dodonov had a couple of points. They're getting points because they're doing the little things. And yeah, Islanders are so-so, but like they beat the Oilers. The Oilers are a good team. Top heavy, but a good team. Yeah, the Blackhawks are terrible, but they went out and beat them handedly with these guys playing a big role in that. I do think Jonathan Drouin is becoming, outside of Joel Edmondson, a sneaky top piece for the Canadians to move at the deadline here. And there's the minute he goes somewhere else, we already know how this is all going to go, but that's, you know, if he lights it up fine, I think he's becoming that piece though. When he plays like this, where he's involved and engaged and you see plays happening, he's unlucky to not have a goal this season. Truly he is. And when it happens, is he going to start flooding him in? I don't know because he doesn't have to be a shooter on his line. He can do what he does best, and that's make plays. Armia works well cycling the puck. Druan gets to the soft spots and finds Christian Dvorak or to the point or whatever, and it works. And that's and that's a good thing. Te good teams will find that role for Druan. The Canadians found it now this late in the season, which not really their fault with injuries and everything else. But teams are going to look at this and go, we have that kind of setup here, and we can put him here, and he can be – that third liner, shelter him against top, against top, away from top competition, put him on power play one or power play two, and watch those points roll. And even though they're secondary assists, he's still facilitating play. And it really does make me think Druan is slowly becoming someone that I think is going to be on a lot of trailers. I don't think he's going to get a ton, a ton. I think if you can get like a second round pick and maybe that AHL guy that you don't have room for, great. Or you get a B level prospect in like a third. That's probably okay because his value coming into the season was, was nothing. nothing. So 
it's it's only building up from here, I think, right now. Uh, and while Joel Edmondson sits on the sideline, teams are like, well, who do they have that's healthy? Sean Monahan is out still. That hurts. But Drew Ant's playing better. Dodonov is playing better. These are pieces that net draft picks. And that's what Kent Hughes wants to do because you can package draft picks with other draft picks and get, get higher uh, draft picks. <laughs> bingo. So I really do think that Jonathan Drouin is sneakily becoming like one of the Canadians top trade options going into this deadline. Now. I'm very, very inclined to agree with you. Um, and I do want to spend some time obviously being sad about Arbor Jack. but also talking about two fights in this game. Um, got a little, got a little, uh, what do you call it? I don't want to say dicey because it was entertaining stupid. for me. It was stupid. Stupid. It was, it was very, stupid. very stupid. It was stupid. Um, so we're going to talk about Arbor Jack guy's injury, what this means for the Canadians for the remainder of the season, but also we're going to touch on us fight on those fights. And that is coming up in just one moment. But first, this episode is also brought to you by Built Bar. And if you're looking for a delicious treat, but you don't want fat and calories, then you got to try Built Bar. It is a protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar. And they're so delicious because they're covered in 100% real chocolate. And they come in such delicious flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. That coconut almond one, it tastes exactly like two well-known candy bars that I really love. It's so, so good. And they're all really good because they have only 130 calories, if that's something that you care about. There's only four grams of sugar and a whopping 17 grams of protein in all of those bars. And you can find the bars at Walmart or Sam's Club, or you can also find them online. And you'll find them uh, online at Built bar.com and you can use the promo code locked on 15 to get 15 percent off your order that's builtbar.com and use locked on 15 to get 15 percent off your order shall we discuss some fights it's like i was born for this um <laughs> Do we do the good or the bad? Should we do Arbor Jack Eye first or should we do uh, the stupidity that was this Blackhawks game? Let's talk about Arbor Jack Eye and right. then let's talk about the fights in the Blackhawks game. Let's end on the stupid note. So, and we talked about this a little bit in the recap with everything on in Monday's episode. It's not great that the word indefinitely was used because Arbor Jackeye's fight with Vincent DeHarnay, Jackeye landed the only punch, and it appears that he tried to punch a dude so hard, he likely popped his shoulder or broke his wrist or hand. He pointed to his shoulder, so it, the logical line of thinking is something there is completely borked and gone wrong. They said indefinitely he's likely getting his tests and second opinions or third opinions or whatever, it's really unfortunate because we talk about bright spots on this team. Rafael Harvey Pinard has been fun. Alex Belziel has been fun. Seeing Justin Barron come up and Jordan Harris playing well has been fun. But Arbor Jack has been that like chaos demon on this team that has made it worth tuning in. He can rush the puck up the ice and on the next shift, he might just pick a dude up and like mortal combat fatality them into a net. And that's super dope. And now he's out. We don't know how long it could be week to week. It could be the end of the season. We don't know. Um, I think though, this changes their approach to the deadline a little bit because if Jack guy is out long-term and they're going to be looking to trade Edmondson or, you know, Weidman, if they can get picks, they're going to be looking to add someone to this because Laval is running low on defense, they just got healthy and given that the Rocket are going to likely make the playoffs if things keep going well, they want to keep that team on track because there's development happening there with prospects and stuff right now. So I, I can't help but wonder if they take on in a deal, we're going to take on a, a, a veteran contract that a team wants to get rid of. You know, give us another pick and we will take this contract on so you can free up space to do something else. They, they did it with Sean Monahan. And I can see them doing that again, especially if they trade some of these other contracts out. We have space. Please give us some of these contracts you don't want anymore or prospect or whatever with that. It, it all depends on how bad the news comes back. But him being out indefinitely, 
uh, is not a great sign. Uh, and if you think he lost that fight, um, I think you should remove your head from your butt. So <laughs> I had to be polite on this podcast because we're a family friendly show. Um, I think, like, my question is, who thought that he didn't win that fight? I'm not going to name Twitter names because that's probably mean to do. But uh, you can see that quote tweet on my profile at Scott Matlon on Twitter. Uh, feel free to dunk on it at your leisure. So it's honestly I I I how, how can anyone think that Arbor Jack I lost that fight? I mean. I mean. Speaking of people who lost fights, um, <laughs> let's talk about that. We're going to talk about the one fight in this Blackhawks game that actually made sense, at least from my point of view. Connor Murphy hit Nick Suzuki, clean hit. Suzuki kind of get caught with his head down. It wasn't from behind, didn't actually hit him in the head. Just caught Nick Suzuki not reacting well along the boards there. Josh Anderson immediately on the ice goes after him. Once they finally got, you know, squared off, Anderson just haymaker, 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 haymaker. Takes Connor Murphy. I don't think Connor Murphy wanted that fight at all, and I don't really blame him. Josh Anderson is a large, very handsome human being, uh, and when he gets angry, I don't. I don't think that's what you want in this game here. And that one made sense. And then later on in the game, I don't remember who it was. Someone blasted him, and I think it was Connor Murphy into the end boards, potentially a little bit from behind, not to my liking. And he was slow to get up. And I went, I swear to God, if Josh Anderson's hurt, I am going to just walk into the sea and never be heard from again. Please Thankfully, do that. well, I'm still here, aren't I? And he's clearly fine. So that's good. Stupid, though. And when I say stupid, I mean, I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot of weird fights in my day. I've watched Xavier Simino fight a guy who is a foot taller than him this year. <laughs> and I think the weirdest thing about this is Michael Pozzetta absolutely obliterated max domi domi kicked a pass like, back like, why well domi was there just admiring his backwards pass to nobody he posed he passed like the ghost of like you know al capone behind him somewhere and pizzetta just his eyes had to light up and he hit him square in the chest hammered him against the boards the play went the other way and david savard scored a goal super cool Several minutes later, last minute of the game, Pizzetta is finishing finishing off a minute and like 15 second shift. It's a long time. Just got out of the offensive zone. Reese Johnson would not let him change and challenged him to a fight. What happened in this fight is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> Johnson starts hitting Pizzetta. Pizzetta swings once or twice. You can tell that he is gassed and doesn't really want this. So he holds him at an arm's length and Johnson just starts jabbing him in, in the, in, in the midsection repeatedly. <laughs> and like an older brother holding their younger sibling, like at bay, Pizzetta's just like, he looks like he's annoyed that this is happening. He's just <laughs> standing there. He's not jostling him. He's not moving. He's, he's just, just taking that. These, Put these <laughs> rabbit punches to the kidneys and then he turns around and uppercuts him and takes him down and it's like what was the point of all this had you fought him right after the hit understandable but you didn't you, you waited, waited all the way until the end of the game and the end of his shift you waited like 10 minutes <laughs> to fight him at the end of the shift and then he didn't even want to fight you was annoyed that you were there didn't even really throw many punches and then you lost it you're already getting shut out you've been embarrassed your team looks like crap and now you tried to do one thing to help you know win some favor with your fans and stick up for your teammate and you still got your butt kicked and like it's dumb there's no other it's capital d dumb I don't understand. Like, I understand it, but, like, challenge him sooner, and it makes more sense. Doing it at the end of the game is just, like, coward stuff. Like, it's just absolutely, like, you're looking for an easy way out with this, and you still lost. It's embarrassing. Across the board, embarrassing. Like, you got beat up on the score sheet, on the stat sheet, 
every which way that you could get your butt kicks in Montreal, you did. And you know what? You, 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 I will figure out which way to put my hand on this damn show one of these one? days. Let me see. Do the other yeah. one. I, yeah. I did this. Like it, it's not. It's it's, it's the it's the. Sorry. It's this. Yeah, it's this that. is. The, yeah. <laughs> that's the one. That's like, the one. The I need my right have... hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's late, and we've both had a long day. If you, in case you're wondering why, I don't know which direction an L is supposed to go on camera here. <laughs> we've done this for four years. <laughs> If you're well, listening like, to this podcast, like, I'm okay. so sorry. So I'm the so sorry. It's only been a year, okay? So, so that's the excuse. But if you're listening to the podcast, essentially, Scott is trying to do Here's Your L to the Chicago Blackhawks. Oh, and thanks he for reminding know which me. Hand to use. Um, and now he's been reminded to tweet the Here's Your L tweet at the Chicago Blackhawks. In the meantime, this episode is now over after all the shenanigans. I think it kind of went like this game. It meandered a little bit. Um, (laughs) There were some fights. Uh, There was an inexplicable ending to the episode. All of that. So if you liked what you heard or saw, uh, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on Twitter at LO underscore Canadians. You'll find Scott on Twitter at Scott Batley. You'll find me at The Active Stick. Please send us emails at lockedoncanadians at gmail.com. We love it. And if you want to leave a mailback question in the YouTube comments, please write mailback questions somewhere in the beginning of the sentence. So we'll know that it's not just a discussion topic. It is also something that you want us to bring up on the mailbag. Thank you so much for listening. We will talk to you tomorrow.